Oh, your mercy comes in like a flood. I need to repent again. I'll deal with shame and regret. Oh, your grace covers me with your blood. I am yours. Oh, it's a good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hey, welcome to church this morning. We're glad you're here. It's good to see you all. Beautiful day today. Wow. Um, Hey, if you're visiting with us, can you hear me? If you're visiting with us, first of all, welcome to you. Special welcome. Um, Hope you are uh, having a great day, and uh, we're just glad you're here as well. I have two things for visitors, Um, And then I got something for everybody that's been here a while. So if you're visiting with us, in the back of your bulletin, there's a tear-out sheet that looks like this. Fill it out, please. Drop it in the offering basket. Let us know you were here, if you got any questions or if you'd like any contact. Um, And we appreciate you doing that. Uh, Second thing, there is a yellow book. Now, for almost 15 years, I've been standing here once a month telling you there's a blue book, but now it's yellow. So if I get it wrong someday, you know why. But it's, it's yellow. And uh, today I took a minute to read this book because uh, I haven't read it for 10 or 15 years. And uh, it reminded me of a prayer I had for you last time I was up here a month ago. And uh, my prayer was that your, 
that God would have you or you would find God's mission in your place. And as I'm reading this book, it reminded me of that prayer. And so if you're new visiting today, I would encourage you to take a book, a yellow book, with you and read about our church. And if you've been here a long time, I would encourage you to pick this up and read through it again. And maybe it just helps you put in perspective where God wants you to be in the church. So take some time to do that. It was good. So thank you. Hey, announcements today. Um, I'm like in and out, aren't I? Announcements today. uh, Men's Bible study. We have a busy week at church this week. Men's Bible study is at 6 p.m. on Monday night. The women's group is meeting Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Wednesday, we have our weekly family night. So I want to hear there's an adult study, something for all ages. But we also have going on Soup and Substance uh, at Peace Evangel and Potter as well. Um, and then Thursday this week is our annual business meeting. That will start at uh, 6.30 p.m. And uh, all are welcome. Uh, m- official members would be voting at that meeting for the budget and whatnot but all are welcome to attend. There's birthdays this week. Moving on to birthdays. We we have a number of birthdays this week. We have Logan Bortz today. Happy birthday, Logan. We have Brad Poy on Tuesday. August Pollard on Wednesday. Mike Reamer on Wednesday. Jocelyn Tam on Friday. And Edward Stren on Saturday. I don't have any anniversaries listed, so. All right, let's take a minute and uh, bow our heads and hearts. Welcome Jesus with us today. Jesus, we are so grateful for you. You are the almighty God, creator, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And in all your greatness and all your glory, you are mindful of each of us. You care for each of us. You love us. And we are grateful. Lord, we welcome you to this place today. We ask that you would move here, that our praise would be pleasing to you as we worship you today. Fill our hearts with joy in your spirit, Lord, and guide us in all we do. We ask your blessing on the word that Pastor Joe will share with us today. And uh, Lord, touch each of our hearts and move us in your spirit this day. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please stand for the reading of the word this morning. Our first reading is Psalm 138, verse 6. Though the Lord is great, he cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. And from Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by coming obedient to death, even death on the cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you are able, remain standing as we worship in song. for 
So this time in our service, we'll have some prayer requests, and uh, we'll bring them before our Lord together. Um, Terry has asked for prayer for Chris for a job, uh, Chris Grogan, and for his son Andrew, um, for Andrew's back, and for the Lord's work in his life. Um, Wendy asked for prayer for uh, one, I think it's Burkhart that was killed in a fire this week. Um, Julia's Thanksgiving for Brad is handling his treatment well and just prayer for healing and strength for Brad uh, as he starts radiation. And then uh, for the family members struggling emotionally, spiritually, physically, and just God's healing and provisions. So we're going to pray for them today. Um, some of you may know Brent Berglund lost his mother on Friday, so we'll lift them up today. So, all right. If you would join me. Jesus, you are a good, great, and holy, loving God. And Lord, we trust you with all our lives. And today we gather in your name, knowing because you told us that when we gather in your name, you are with us, Lord. So we're honored with your presence today. And we lift these things up to you, Jesus. You are the great healer. The almighty power, Lord. Today we lift up Chris, who needs some help with the job, Lord. And uh, you know Chris, and you know his situation. And Lord, we just ask your hand upon it that you would open the right doors for Chris and close the wrong doors and that you would provide for him, Lord. And Lord, today for Andrew, we lift up Andrew. Oh, Lord, for Andrew and his back, he's struggling, Lord. And uh, Lord, that your hand of healing would be upon him and he would know that it's you. That he would know you. And through this, and in his life, you would do a work, Lord. And then he would pursue you for it, Lord. Lord, we lift up the Burkhart family, Lord, and friends in their loss. We ask your healing upon them and your peace in some way, in your way, Lord, that you would be honored through this, that people would be drawn to you as well. But Lord, bring healing to that family, Lord. 
Lord, we lift up Brad today. We thank you for the treatment that's going well. And we ask your hand upon these next steps, Lord. We ask that you would bring healing to Brad. That you would give him strength. That you would encourage him, Lord. That he would know your presence every step of every day through this time. And as he walks through the valley, that you would just carry him, Lord. And Lord, for the rest of the family, Lord, what a difficult time. And the only thing we can do is lean on you, Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask for revival of spirit and strength and healing and that you would provide for this family, Lord, our family. Put your blessing upon them, Lord. And again, Lord, just carry them through this time. Lord, we lift up Brent and his family today with the loss of his mother. Lord, that uh, they would mourn her loss and at the same time they would celebrate her life, Lord. And Lord, I know that she was a faithful servant of yours. And so we praise and rejoice that she is with you this day. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I ask that you continue to work here in this church in the people that are the church, Lord. That each of us would know the purpose that you have planned for our lives, that we know that you have gifted each one of us differently and you would guide us to use those gifts for your purpose, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the free gift of salvation that you paid the price for. In Jesus' name, amen. Could I get the offering ushers, please? Father, you give us all that we need. You give us provision, place to live, food to eat, fellowship, Lord. We need fellowship, and you give that to us here, Lord. And as we give back from your provision, we ask your blessing upon it, that it be with joy, and that we guide each decision in the use of these funds. For your glory alone, Jesus, amen.
All right, take a minute and say hello to each other, and uh, children can head off to Children's Church. Good morning. Good morning. Be with us this morning. Thanks to those of you who are joining us online. Glad. I mean, what a beautiful day we have to enjoy. And I hope that you have an opportunity maybe to get outside and enjoy some of this beautiful sunshine this afternoon and such. So once upon a time, there was a story of a rider who um, was out on a ride on his horse and came across some soldiers and uh, they were in the process of moving a log from a path on the pathway there. And um, as this rider rode up to them, he saw th- them struggling to get the log out of the way. And the corporal standing along the side of the path. And, um, and so he didn't say anything, but he thought to himself, how come the corporal isn't engaging and helping these guys out? So he asked the corporal and asked them why he did not lend assistance. And of course, the corporal said, well, I am the corporal. I'm the one that gives the orders. Well, this rider, kind of watching this, decided to dismount his horse, walk over to the soldiers and lend a hand and move that wood out of the way so they could pass through. Who was that kind rider? None other than George Washington, the commander-in-chief. You know, that story is a story that displays great humility by the president on one hand, but on the other hand, such arrogance by that corporal, to think that he was too good to get in there to lend a hand and, and such. So a story like that doesn't necessarily need any explanation from us and um, from me this morning. And unfortunately, if we're honest, there's times in which maybe we act more like the corporal than we do the president. And so today we're, we, we're kind of in this new series, uh, From the Ashes, And um, we're talking about life lessons from the life of Christ. And so we're going to look at a life lesson from the life of Christ. Last week we looked at temptation, and we looked at the temptation that Jesus faced, and every time he faced the temptation, what did he do? But he turned to the Word of God. And he said, but the Word says. And so my challenge to us last week was to get into the Word and allow the Word to guide us and direct us. And then there's that verse in Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that says to us, that uh, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And when you're tempted, he's always going to give a way out. So I don't know, maybe you, find you found yourself this week when maybe temptation was bearing down on you to think to yourself, all right, where's the exit strategy? Where's the door, God, you're going to open for me? And, uh, and such. So that was last week. Today we're going to talk about the humility of Christ. The humility of Christ. And I don't know about you, but that, that, that aspect really moves me. And that song really spoke to that that we just sang um, about the humility of Christ. Uh, we have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who humbled himself to conquer death. And, um, and so we can experience abundant life. We know that John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life abundantly. And he showed us and modeled for us what that looks like. I would say to us today that as great of an example that the president was for us in that story I read for us moments ago, it pales in comparison to the example that Christ is for us. Jesus set the ultimate example of what it is to have humility and to serve others. If you've got your Bibles this morning, uh, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. In uh, Philippians chapter 2, we're going to jump into um, verse number 3 and uh, look at a few verses there uh, this morning. And so starting in Philippians chapter 2 and um, starting in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself, 
Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And how many know that's harder to do than just meets the eye? And he goes on, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. So Paul's telling us as followers of Christ, as Christians, uh, that we need to have or display in our own life um, the same attitude, the same actions that Jesus had. May our life mirror his, is what Paul is saying. And then going on from there, he says in verse number six and thereafter, um, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. And being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you. And Lord, as we look at the example of Christ today, and Lord, the King of Kings, Lord, that you would leave heaven and come down to live the life that you did, to be the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf by laying your life aside, only to take it up again. Father, we just see the display of humility in your life. And Lord, I just pray that we wouldn't just see it today, we wouldn't just hear it declared today, but Lord, I pray it would fall on receptive hearts. And Lord, we're trusting that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us to how we need to live this out, not just today and tomorrow, but for the remainder of our days, God, that we would just put this into practice and give us the strength to do it, Lord, we ask. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So here's some areas in which Paul points out or Paul identifies that were um, things that were evident in Jesus' life that he would say needs, would, should be evident in our life. And the first of which is this, don't take advantage of your position. Now all of us, I would say, all of us at one point or another are going to lead others. And, and, and for some of you, it might be siblings. <laughs> you know, you're so thankful when mom and dad finally had another child because sooner or later you will be over that one. Um, you know, but um, all of us, all of us at some point are going to have an opportunity to be over others. And, and, and Paul's challenge for us is don't take advantage of other people. And he reminds us that Jesus had all the power and opportunity in the universe to use his position to his advantage. And instead, he chose to lay it aside. He became a servant. I mean, Jesus, our King of kings, Lord of lords, became a, a servant, and, um, and how that should motivate us. You know, there's a couple different ways that we can receive esteem in this world. There's two ways, actually. One way is through the world's way, and that is put yourself forward, put yourself in the center of attention, um, look only out for yourself, don't look out for the needs of others, and that's one way the world would say, if you want to put yourself forward, that, that would be the way it would prescribe. And then there's the other way. Now, the other way is a way of humility. That's God's way. Humble yourself, serve others, and seek their needs over yours. Cultivate humility. How many know that humility doesn't just come naturally, right? And, you know, one of the paradoxes of the Christian life also is that when God sees your genuine humility, He exalts you. And, um, and so that's great. So don't take advantage of your position and uh, don't lord, lord yourself over others. Uh, the second thing would be to serve others. When Christ laid aside his royal position, he chose instead to become a servant. You know, throughout his earthly ministry, you see him again and again attending to the needs of others, meeting their needs, reaching out to them. And uh, we'll talk more about that before we're finished up. You know, a lot of times the world would say um, your level of importance would be determined by how many people serve you. But in God's economy, in God's accounting, he would say, what's really important in your life is how many people are you serving? And, um, and so and, and we need to serve others. It's better to serve than it is to be served, Jesus would say. The next area, and that is um, give your life away. Give your life away. Jesus' um, humility led him ultimately to the cross. 
And again, we're all familiar with that story. Uh, I mean, Jesus, the perfect sacrifice on our behalf, he lived a sinless life. He's the very one who went to the cross and died in our place, humbled himself, laid his life aside, and um, only to take it up again. And, um, and so we kind of know that story, but I would ask of us today, what is our, what is our story? What's my story? What's your story? And, um, you know, here's a, a question that we need to ask, and that is, where are you holding on too tightly to the things that you want? What are you holding on too tightly in your life? And that would be your kingdom, your things, your dreams, your aspirations. You know, we, you know part of the, one of the songs there is that we surrender all. You know, and, and we come to Him and we sing that song, I surrender all. And, uh, and sometimes we're like, Lord, we surrender all, but Lord, please don't touch this area of my life over here. Right? You know, I, I'm... But Lord, when we say it, it's all, it's all on the table. There's nothing I'm going to hold back. Jesus held nothing back. The very Son of God left heaven to come down, to humble himself, to be a servant, and um, gave his life away so that we could find life. Here's a quote from somebody, not mine, but somebody's, and that is, humility isn't as much a destination to be reached as it is an attitude to be embraced. An attitude to be embraced. And that's really what Paul was getting at in verse number five when he would tell us there, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. Now, here's, a, here's some words from Henry Blackaby on a devotion on this particular verse. And he says, attitudes do not just happen. We choose them. Paul urged believers to have the same attitude that Jesus had. Jesus was the Son of God. His place was at the right hand of His Father, ruling the universe. No position could be more glorious or honorable than the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And Jesus' relationship with the Father gave him the right to this honor. Yet Jesus chose not to hold on to this right. Nothing, not even his position in heaven, was so precious to him that he could not give it up if his Father asked him. His love for his Father compelled him to make any sacrifice necessary in order for him to be obedient to him. And then he finished his devotion with a probing question, one I pose to you now, and that is this. What might the Father ask you to give up? What might the Father ask you to give up? Humility is a big deal. And, and, and it's kind of silly to kind of say that because humility in itself is trying not to draw attention to itself. So when we say humility is a big deal, but it is, it's a real big deal. It's a big deal in God's kingdom. The Bible encourages us to be humble and gives us warnings about the destructive nature of pride. We know that pride is the, one of the great enemies of humility. We already read what the Apostle Paul had to say um, in Philippians here. I want to tell you, there's a couple other verses from a couple other church leaders um, in regards to humility that I think are important for us to look at. And, um, and so the first of which is First Peter. And uh, so Peter, a leader in the early church, uh, gave us this instruction, First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. He says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and He will lift you up in due time. Again, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, another church leader, who um, James, who kind of gave leadership to the church in Jerusalem, and quotes this same verse that um, Peter quoted here when he says in James chapter 4, verse number 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, again, uh, both these guys, these leaders in the early church, encouraged us to have humility. Both of them quoted Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, um, in reference to those uh, two guys. And um, I don't think any of us, when you think about these verses, um, I don't think any of us want to be uh, in opposition to God. 
or have God in opposition to us. Anybody signing up for that one? I don't think any of us would want to be on that other end of that. But when we display pride, when we display arrogance, God's word is true. He said he opposes the proud. And I don't think that there's one of us that wants to be on that receiving end of that. And if that wasn't bad enough, that in and of itself should cause us to be humble and to act with humility in our life. But if that isn't enough, let me give you another Old Testament verse that might also sway you to the side of humility. At least I would hope. And it's a verse we read in our opening. And it's Psalms 138, verse 6. The NIV renders it this way. Though the Lord is on high, He looks upon the lowly, but the proud He knows from afar. Now, the uh, New Living Translation renders it this way. Though the Lord... Uh, is great. He cares for the humble, but he keeps his distance from the proud. And so pride and arrogance are incompatible with humility, which means that those attitudes, when we display them, keep God's out at arm's distance. (laughs) It also makes them be in opposition to us. You know, we need to understand our need for God in our life. You know, I need him every hour. I need Thee. Every day I need Thee, Lord. And, um, you know, we can't, you know, and before we're done, I'm going to just talk about, friends, we can't get into heaven without Him. And we need to humble ourselves and recognize our need for Him in our life. Looking at a couple of those verses, uh, looking at um, uh, 1 Peter um, chapter 5 and verse 5 and 6, where it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And, and uh, it goes on from there in verse number 7, and it says, and cast all your cares on Him. Now, somebody who is self-sufficient and somebody who is, um, they're going to do it themselves, they don't see their need for God, therefore they're not going to cast their cares on Him because they're going to be, they're going to do it themselves. But the one that's humble that says, God, I can't do this on my own, but I'm going to cast all my cares on you because I know that you care for me. Or you look in the, you look in the James portion, James, when he says in um, 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the tumble. Verse 7, he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then verse 8, it says to us, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, the only way we draw near to God is in a heart of humility where we say, God, we need you. God, we're so thankful. We're grateful for all that you've done for us. We recognize our need for you and we can't do it apart from you. And so when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. And uh, that's another reason for which that we ought to be humble. Friends, make no mistake about it. Pride can and will destroy you. Pride is one of the greatest enemies of the Christian walk. And here's some thoughts from Blackaby. And um, Blackaby on the area of pride. He says, pride is an overly high opinion of yourself. It motivates you to do things that you know are not Christ-like. And if And it hinders you from doing what brings glory to God. He says, pride influenced Adam and Eve to try to become like God. Pride motivated Cain to murder his brother. It was pride that motivated Joseph's brothers to sell him into slavery. And pride caused King Saul to resent David so much that he became jealous of him and wanted to murder him. And it was pride that led King Hezekiah to foolishly reveal his nation's wealth to his enemies. Pride was at the root of the Pharisees' anger towards Jesus, and pride was the reason the disciples argued over rank in the kingdom. He goes on to make this application then. Pride is your your relentless enemy. If you succumb to its influence, there will be consequences. You may know that you have offended somebody, but pride holds you back for asking for forgiveness. You may realize that you need to reconcile a broken relationship, but pride will lead you to deny that need. And the Spirit may convict you that you are living a sinful lifestyle, but pride will discourage you from admitting it. And he talks about humility. Humility, on the other hand, is pleasing to God and, pleasing, or, and places your life in a position where God will honor you. 
And then he says, if pride has creeped into your, has pride crept in in some area of your life, ask God to give you victory over it before it robs you of God's will for you. I'd like to spend some time as we bring this to a close this morning because we're talking about life lessons from the life of Christ. We've talked a little bit out of Philippians and what Jesus did for us. I want to now go to the Gospel of John in John chapter 13, verses 1 to 17 here. And the account of Scripture here is Jesus washing His disciples' feet. What an act of humility that we see in the life of Christ displaying this to His disciples. And... Let me just set it up a little bit. I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Many of us are familiar with it. If you're not, I would encourage you to at some point today uh, go back and read back through there. But I'm going to highlight some things out of this. First of which is verse 1. Um, it says in verse number 1, it was just before the Passover festival. Now Jesus knew that His hour had come for Him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved His own who were in the world, he loved them to the very end. So what we have here is Jesus knows it's now, his time. He's about ready to fulfill his mission, go to the cross on our behalf. He's having dinner with his disciples, and um, he has spent three and a half years with them. He's done life with them. He's at, ate with them, traveled with them, done life with them. He's taught them, instructed them. He's conversed with them. I mean, he's done, and, and now he's about ready to hand this off to them. You think about the, you know, John chapter 13 through 17, those chapters of Scripture are very powerful. I'd encourage you to read them during the Lenten season. Just Jesus' final words to His disciples, the instruction that He gave them. And, and so, Jesus loved His disciples. He poured Himself into them. And um, now earlier, it wasn't too far be, uh, removed from a time in which His disciples were arguing about who was the greatest. Can you imagine? I have three brothers, and at times when we get together, we all want to know who's better, right? And with my older brother, it's always who's taller. Even though I tell him that I am, he doesn't believe me. Um, but um, with these disciples, they're arguing over who was the greatest. They even had conversation about seats of honor in Jesus' kingdom once he takes his place. And Jesus would have something to say to them in regards to this. He now teaches them a life lesson. We have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Himself, who gets up from His spot. They've all made their way in, and I would encourage you, I put a little blurb of, uh, again, another devotion from Blackaby on Humility in your bulletin. It talks about this encounter with Jesus washing His disciples' feet and how He talks about how they all went in there and assumed their positions in the room. And again, they were looking for their places of honor. And yet Jesus was looking for his place to serve. And so Jesus gets up from where he was sitting and uh, removed his outer garment and uh, you know, went and got the wash basin, got the pitcher of water, got the towel, and without saying anything, began to make his way to the first disciple, knelt down, took his feet, washed them, went to the next of course, when we got to Peter, Peter's like, okay, Jesus, if you're washing me, have at it. And he says, look, Peter, you don't need to wash everything. If you've had a bath, you only need to just wash your feet. And um, of course, has that. But he washes each one of their feet, disciple after disciple. If there was anybody in the room that maybe had the position, you go back to his position and who he is, he could have sat back and said, you guys all should have gotten up and washed my feet. But the very one that maybe had that place where he could say that of anybody is the one that got up and began to wash their feet. He was that servant. And now it's believed that uh, the washing of the feet, that was one of the most um, lowest of, of tasks that would be tasked to a servant. Um, and so Jesus took on the lowest of the low is positions as far as a servant the feet were considered to be the dirtiest, the most unclean part of the body. And, um, you know, and I think when Jesus washed their feet, you know, he didn't do it with an attitude, okay? I don't think he thought, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. You ever done a job and then, you know, you're doing the job, but really your heart's not in it? I don't think it was that way at all. Jesus, he loved his disciples. 
And, and, and I think one by one, he tenderly grabbed their feet or, you know, took their feet in the hand and began to wash them, taking care of it, setting it down, grabbing the next foot and gently washing it. I don't think he scrubbed on it and thought, well, if you only really knew how, you know, I, I don't think there was an attitude at all. And, and he truly loved his disciples. And so he was serving them. Let's pick this story up now in uh, verse 14. So he's gone around the room. Uh, he's washed their feet. And, and now he says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So Jesus' hope was that his disciples would pick up on his example and live it out in their own life. That they too would carry this on. Jesus wanted his disciples to know how much he loved them, and so he took the position of a simple house servant and took on the task of washing their dirty feet. So what is the takeaway for us today? He did this to show that no one is too important to get down and serve another. He did this to show his love and his care for his disciples. Now, there's a, is there any task that you think is beneath you? Just give that some thought. Is there any task that you think is beneath you? Now, years ago, and, and a task came to mind when I was thinking of this point, and um, so I was a, a youngster, I was in my teenage years, and I'd do anything for a buck, right? And so um, somebody um, reached out to me and said, hey, look, we're going to be in the parade, and uh, we're looking for some volunteers, well, we're not looking for volunteers, we're looking to hire somebody to follow us along in the parade. And um, well, they were riding horses. Let me just tell you, my job was to make sure that I pick up the exhaust from the horses. And, um, and so I, can you imagine how humbling that is? You're on this parade route and you're dressed up and you're, you got the scoop shovel and you're picking up half the horses. But you know what? I got paid for doing it. So um, <laughs> is there any task that you think is beneath you? Again, remembering that pride is the enemy of servitude. You know, may our heart... May our attitude, may our life reflect the example of Christ, not only in attitude, but also in action. That we would say, to, say anything, anytime, anywhere, God, because of what you've done for me, there's nothing I wouldn't. Jesus laid aside everything to come to be a servant for us. So again, the question for us today is, who needs to be served this week? Think about your life. Who needs to be served this week? Is it a spouse? Is it a child? Is it a parent? Is it a neighbor, co-worker, um, somebody else? Who needs to be served this week? And I just trust that the Holy Spirit will help you fill that in for you and what that would look like in your world. Because truly to be great is to be a servant. We need to open our eyes and our needs and look at the interest of others. Looking at this verse again, what Jesus said, and again, he says, listen, after I've done all this for you, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a quiz on this lesson I just gave you, so when I come back someday, I'm going to quiz you on this, and I want you to remember this. No, what he did is he said, I want you to do these things. Now that I've, I've, I've given you an example to follow, now do them yourself. Put it into action. In other words, we need to roll up our sleeves. We need to get our hands dirty. Uh, more than just talk about it, we need to do it. Servanthood is action. And so Jesus didn't just tell them about what it is to be great in his kingdom. He showed them. And Jesus didn't talk about being a servant, but he took off his outer clothing and put on a towel, and he served. He put it into action. So who needs to be served this week? And how will the example of Jesus impact your daily routine starting tomorrow? 
starting tomorrow? Who is it that you need to serve? And, and, and what might that look like? You know, there's always some task around the house. And I don't think my house is any different than your house. Um, but, you know, there's tasks like cleaning the microwave. You ever just, you know, you don't cover something in the microwave. You're heating up a bowl of chili and, and then pretty soon it, and if I do that and I find out, my wife does not appreciate that very much at all. Um, but it has to get clean now and then, the microwave. It's not a task. That, I mean, it's not that there's other jobs that are probably worse than that. And sometimes the oven, how often does your oven get cleaned at your house? Now, maybe you're on a regular basis. Maybe your oven gets cleaned far more than mine. Um, not that mine's terrible, but, you know, it's a task that it's always gets put on the back burner because nobody wants to do it. You know, I'm, you know and, and there's other tasks around your house. You know, and, 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 and again, I go back, is there any job that we think is beneath us? Or that somehow we think that, well, that's somebody else's responsibility, not mine, and uh, such. And so serving others, I like the, the adage and I like to just try to live my life by, you know, leave it better than you found it type of thing. And, you know, another, another thought came to me as I'm thinking about this task and thinking about Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And you think about tasks that nobody likes. Now, I don't know, maybe your break room at your work is really clean and it's kept clean and maybe people just really um, just check that box, right? They take care of that break room. At, 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 but I've been told at times that there are some break rooms that don't always stay as clean, meaning sometimes people eat and leave their dishes in the sink, okay? And, um, or they leave stuff in the fridge and things get spilled and nobody cleans it up, right? Now, let's just say, um, I'm thinking of the Aaron's corporate. We have Aaron's right here. I love Aaron's community and, uh, you know, uh, I love the fact that they're here. But how it, it would be like Dan Aaron's coming into the break room down at Aaron's and greeting people, how are you today? Great. And goes over and starts washing up the dishes that are in the sink. Or goes over and straightens up the fridge and cleans it however it needs to be addressed. You know, I mean, somebody that you would look at, that, that he's the owner of the company. He is the guy at the top. And he would just come in. And then at, before he leaves the break room, hey, guys, have a great day. You know, and just, you know, that, that is kind of like a, a thought of somebody in that regard. Um, I hope that there's not a job that we think is beneath us. Let me just give us a couple things. Um, let me go back to, no, I think I made that point. I'm done with that, about the opposing the proud and, and whatever. Um, I want to give you the ABCs to walking this out. The ABCs to walking this out, putting this into practice in your life. The A is going to be this. Ask God to make you a servant every day this week. So when you get up in the morning, get ready to start your day, just have this as a thought. Maybe write it on your mirror in your bathroom in your bathroom when you get up to brush your teeth or whatever you're going to do. Just that it'll greet you, it'll remind you, be a servant today. And you know, just ask God, God, how can I be a servant today? Who in my life that am I going to encounter today that I can serve? And so Lord, make me a servant today that you would have that desire, you would go into your day with that approach. The second thing is, is be open to opportunities to serve. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. You're going to have conversation. You might even have a conversation here following our time. And somebody's going to display or um, make you aware of a need that they have in their life. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's just going to just nudge you and say, you know what? There it is. This week, you're going to have an opportunity to meet that need for them. And, and it might be that, you know, so just be listening, be hearing, be watching for opportunities to serve. And then this last one, because you can do A and you can do B, but if you don't do C, you miss out. So you have to do C, and that is this, commit to action. Commit to doing it. Don't just give it lip service, but you're going to commit to action. You're going to say, you know what? And, and it might be that God would just direct you to make a list. Hey, here's, a, here's some people that I want to serve this week. God, if you open the door... Uh, I'm going to step into those moments and I'm going to serve. Now, um, my, my thing with this also would be this. May this be not just a nice message on a Sunday morning that we say that's great and apply ourselves to a week. But may we commit to this for the remainder of our days that we would display the humility of Christ in our life day after day and look for opportunities to serve. Look for opportunities to be a blessing. And again, Jesus said it is more blessed to serve than it is to be served. 
Um, and, um, and so as we look at the humility of Christ, and I want to pray for us this morning, Alicia's going to come, and, and um, I'm also looking forward to testimonies, and again, not that you, you know, you're going to be out doing these, banging a drum and saying, look at me, serve over here, look at me, but I'd love to hear how God maybe opens the door for you, and, and um, just to put this message into practice uh, this week um, in the weeks to come, and so... Father God, we think about your instruction given to us in your word. Fathers, we think about your kingdom, and Lord, we think about the life that Christ lived and how, Lord, we as followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, to want to be more like Jesus. As Paul would say, Lord, when he says that follow my example as I follow the example of Christ, Lord, may our attitude to want to be more like Jesus and um, Lord, and to do that, Lord, to put this into practice, what does that look like for us? And I pray that we would receive those opportunities to serve this week with joy. Father, that we would get excited about the opportunities to serve. God, that we can make a difference. And again, not that we're wanting to draw attention to ourselves in doing so, but Lord, just because that's how you served, Lord, you just served. And Lord, may we receive that challenge in our own life. And where there's a need and we can help meet it, Lord, may we step into those moments. We trust that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us in what that looks like for us this week and uh, so that we could be a blessing for your kingdom and for your purposes. God, that you would be glorified. And uh, Father, we just thank you. We give you praise. May we walk in humility and uh, surrender to you. And Father, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand this morning and Alicia's going to come. And...
preached on salvation this morning, but I, I certainly want to give an invitation. I want to be able to share with somebody that if you might be here this morning or somebody that might be watching online. We talk about humility, and I said that not a, one of us is going to get into heaven without humility. Humility says, I need you. And it, it recognizes God's part that he played on our behalf. There's this thing called sin, and we're all born into a sinful nature. There's not a one of us that hasn't fallen short in some area of our life where we've missed the mark. Scripture is very clear on that. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin, Romans 6.23, the Bible would say the wages for that, that is what you earn, what you deserve, is death. But, the verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we know in Scripture that God demonstrated his own love for us, that when we were in, still sinners, Christ went to the cross and died in our place, Romans 5, 8. And Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, tells us that if we believe in our heart that Jesus went to the cross, died in our place, was buried, rose again, so we believe it in our heart, we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, which, in other words, you recognize that um, you know, you have a sin problem. The only way to rectify that, to get it fixed, is to receive the sacrifice Christ was on your behalf. And, um, and then it says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And uh, friends, we're saved by grace and grace alone. It's not by works. You know, we talked a lot about service today. You, you, can, you can fulfill this message to a T. You can go out and serve like nobody else this week. You, you, you could have all the stars behind your name for all the things that you do this week. Doing those things, friends, won't get you into heaven. Okay? We're saved by grace and grace alone, not by works that anyone should boast. But I will say, as somebody who has recognized their need for God in their life and has accepted him as Savior, will want to do those things because we love our Savior, and we want to please Him, and we want to, but we're not doing it as a means of which to try to gain His love. He couldn't love us any more than He already does. But because of our love for Him is why we would want to do those things. And so if you've not come to that place in your life where you have recognized your need for Jesus, you've humbled yourself and asked Him to come into your life, it's, it's just simply acknowledging that what I just talked about in regards to Jesus, paid the price for you to take care of your sin problem. Ask him to come into your heart. Um, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we, he is faithful and just, he will forgive us all of our sins if we ask him. So we need to ask him. And so it's this thing, it, it's kind of like a gift. So I said, you know, salvation is a gift. And it, it, it's something that you receive. Again, you can't earn it. You just have to accept it. And uh, so if you've not done that, I would just encourage you to do that today. And uh, seek me out. I'd like to have that conversation with you. I'd love to just introduce you to Jesus in a personal way, if that's something you desire. And, uh, but God bless you. Look for opportunities this week to serve. 
Um, look for opportunities just to let your light shine for the glory of God, and uh, God bless you. It's good to have the Pollards here today with uh, Clark and, and also uh, Archers here today. These are the two newest people to our church, so if you've not seen them, don't all rush them at the same time, uh, but uh, um, they are here among us this morning. Good to have them, and God bless you. Have a great week.